we go with another edition of the Stampede Wrestling Show. Coming to you live from Calgary, Alberta, Canada at the Heartbeat Radio Studios. Booker, wrestler, uh, promoter extraordinaire from Calgary, Alberta, part of the famous Hart family, Mr. Bruce Hart. Welcome back to Heartbeat Radio, sir. Thanks very much, Bob, and uh, it's a real uh, honor, and I'm really happy to have Ken on the show. Uh, you know, uh, it was one of the really... Uh, colorful and uh, interesting characters in our business, you know, and uh, just looking forward to sharing some perspectives about him. You know, he's been in so many major territories and been involved in so many uh, incidents with uh, AWA and all that other. So I'm just looking forward to sharing perspectives, you know. It should be a great, great visit. I'd like to introduce longtime referee and promoter in Winnipeg, Mr. Merv Unger. Welcome to Heartbeat Radio, Merv. Good afternoon. Great to have you on. I'm looking forward to uh, sharing some uh, memories of uh, Winnipeg and Minneapolis with you and uh, Ken here. So it should be uh, great to uh, hear some of the uh, perspectives about that uh, golden age of wrestling back in the 70s and 80s. Well, Ken and I have an agreement that what happened in Minneapolis stays in Minneapolis. (laughs) And what happened in Winnipeg stayed in Winnipeg. <laughs> <laughs> I started uh, in Winnipeg in the early 1970s when Ken first started into the AWA and got his training from the Vern Gagne yeah, that, School. That was a- a uh, very uh, productive era, you know. I remember back in those days, old Vern uh, calling my dad, and he he had a bunch of these young prospects that he yep. was developing, including uh, Ric Flair and uh, Paul Persman, who became Buddy Rose. And I remember he sent that Cosro, and my dad wasn't sure if it was a rib or not. <laughs> Iron <laughs> Sheik up up to Calgary, and uh, it was remarkable how many. Uh, guys that came up. I think Chris Taylor was kicking around back then, and I'm not sure if Brad Reingant was in the uh, mix there, but I remember hearing those names, and uh, it's remarkable how many of them uh, went on to become big stars and famous, uh, you know, yeah. huge personalities, and, uh, and I think Ken came in around, maybe around that time. I uh, Yeah, Ken, do you remember who the guys were in your training class? Yeah, we had uh, myself right after I came back from uh, Germany right after the 72 Olympic Games there in Munich, yeah. Germany. Yeah. And Vern, Vern had brought his girls and Greg over there to watch me compete. And uh, I don't think they ever showed up to the actual venue where we were competing. But That, well, that, that was an incredible uh, – that was right around the time of that uh, – Hostage taking and shooting and all that wasn't it? Well, uh, that was uh, yeah, September fifth, nineteen seventy-two. I was, was supposed the, uh, to compete that day. That was the but, Israeli uh, uh, yeah, so, guy that got shot. Or I remember that was a huge story. But oh yeah, there um, were five or six uh, killed in that yeah. thing. Uh, that was uh, Barack Obama's cousin. He yeah, uh, he, he was led the, the uh, charge on that. PLO. Uh, yeah. No, but uh, the guys didn't Chris Taylor uh, participate in your training sessions as well? No, and uh, Chris Taylor and Sergeant Slaughter came uh, the next year in '73. Okay. We were in '72. Was, was Cosro around back then, uh, Ken, or was yeah. he part of that? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. hell yeah! Uh, I remember Cosro, it was... uh, Rick Flair, a kid yeah, Rick... by the name of Bob Brothers, who had played. Uh, well, yeah, I Paul, remember Bob uh, Paul Paul linebacker for uh, the Denver Broncos and the uh, Dolphins well, down there in Miami. And then there was uh, me and uh, Greg Gagne and Jimmy Brunzel. There were six of us. Yeah, but the Iron Sheik, he was there, baby. <laughs> I remember when he came up He came yeah. up to Calgary and he, he told us he had been some kind of a bodyguard or whatever the hell for the Shaw, and he was, he he was, was. running, yeah, he was. you know, it was kind of a funny irony later on, he made out like he was a supporter of the Ayatollah when Vin, Vern, I mean, Vince uh, did the Iron Sheik thing with him. Yeah. <laughs> but, but he, he was thing, like, yeah uh, the ironic thing about that, if uh, Khosrow would have stayed in Iran, 
they would have cut his head off and put it on a pole because yep. they hated the they hated the Shah. And the reason uh, Cosro was a bodyguard, if you're an amateur wrestler, you were automatically inducted into the bodyguard uh, unit uh, to protect the Shah. He, he was almost a bit paranoid, because I remember he's always, when he was up for my dad, he was always running scared of, you know, uh, whether somebody was out to, you know, kidnap him or shoot him or something. Yeah, well, thing, what you know? happened, the reason he was paranoid, on a, in, in 68, he was on the Iranian Olympic team in 68, and yet they went to Mexico City. Well, after the games, they were all supposed to get on the same plane and go back to Iran. Well, Cosro says, fuck this. I'm going to America. <laughs> yeah. And he hitchhiked, yeah, he hitchhiked all the way from uh, uh, Mexico City to Minneapolis. And uh, the reason he wound up in Minneapolis is because he has a cousin that worked for, uh, what the hell, uh, I think he worked for 3M Corporation here in Minneapolis. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he wasn't a bad guy, old cause. Uh, when I knew him anyway, he seemed like pretty... Uh... You know, uh, he was a baby face when he up, worked up here, and he he, he wasn't really yeah. setting the world on fire either. But uh, my dad seemed to get along with him pretty well. He had a pretty yeah. good amateur background, and uh, well, that's why. Yeah, he come from a completely different culture. Yeah. I, I, I'll tell you what happened to Cosro. When Cosro came to America, you know, he was a Christian. He wasn't a Muslim. So he grew yeah, up. Yeah, he seemed very uh, devout. Old cause a. Uh, Right, yeah. But anyway, he had he had to put on that Muslim uh, routine, you know, because, uh, you know, for the wrestling. But he was actually a Christian. When he came here, he didn't smoke, he didn't drink, he didn't swear, he didn't do any drugs, nothing. Right? He was a good old um, red blood American boy. Well, after about five or six years, he was drinking, he was smoking pot. He was popping pills, and he was fornicating. Yeah, fornicating. <laughs> yeah. He, he, he always yeah. said he had to take care. Of, he always had to satisfy his elephant. Well, you yeah. know what his elephant was? It was, it was a dick. <laughs> yeah. I remember he was in his in his I think in his semi-religious days early on when he came up here, Ken, and yeah. he was. Uh, yeah. I think before that we were in some little town called Lethbridge, and he was having some kind of a, a pre-match, uh, whatever, with some ring rats. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> and my dad, uh, and I guess, he was that religious, and I guess you have to take a shower after you've been engaged yeah. or whatever. And, and he hadn't yeah. had his match yeah. yet, and uh, he's uh, getting changed and having a shower, and my dad comes in and says, yeah. where's that fucking cash <laughs> yeah. And uh <laughs> He was in having a shower, and my dad said, Tell me, get, yeah. get, get the fucking ring in. And he was, yeah. uh, my, and then uh, I guess uh, it was part of his uh, yeah. devout whatever, you know, he had to have a shower after he had had some kind of yeah. whatever, you know. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, even though he wasn't a Muslim, he was a Christian, he still followed a, a lot of the, you know, the rules and regulation yeah. of the Muslim faith. But uh, yeah. like I say, after four or five, maybe six years, he was full blown red blood American boy. <laughs> <laughs> one, one of the boys. Yeah, yeah, he was one of the boys. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Uh, go. You, you guys had an incredible uh, class there, Ken. Who who was the uh, who was the main coaches or who was running that for Burn back then? Well, it was mainly Billy Robinson, Don Morocco. Oh, he was down yeah. there too, though. Yeah, and oh, yeah, um, the, yeah, Don Morocco and uh, Jimmy Snuka, Superfly Jimmy Snuka, they they had come into the AWA uh, about two months before we started training camp, and yeah. uh, they had been out working for Don Owens out in Portland, Oregon. Yeah, I remember uh, Don. He was wrestling as Don Morrow back then. That was what his name was in Portland, yeah. Don Don Morrow or something. And uh, I think Billy started up. He, he, uh, came up here from, uh, I think he came in from Japan in about 69 uh, and uh, got over huge up here. He was a hell of a worker. And then uh, Vern kind of stole him from Stu. Stu sent him in there, yeah. and uh, next thing, Vern had kind of, <laughs> my dad said, they kidnapped him. 
or something. Yeah. And, uh, he he became uh, stretched his ass. Yeah. <laughs> he, I think he became a big, a uh, huge star with uh, Vern back. Would have been about seventy, seventy one, somewhere in there. And uh, yeah, but, exactly. uh, well, actually, starting seventy one. Yeah, I said I think it was. Wasn't it seventy one? Yeah. Yeah, yeah and that's when I about... arrived there, and and I knew Billy from Calgary at the time. But in yeah. Winnipeg, no matter what we did, we couldn't get him over as a baby face. The, uh, even as a baby face, he was not getting over with the fans. And, no, but after I it. left, uh, he did switch heel in that territory. But, a lot of guys yeah, didn't like of... Billy. You know, he was sort well, of a... Uh... Billy, Billy was a prick. Yeah, yeah that, was... that, that, that Billy was a, a natural-born heel. Even the rest of us didn't like him. Yeah. <laughs> I remember I was in uh, Hawaii back in the 70s and working with old Peter Maivia, and uh, they, he and Billy had had that uh, yeah. famous fight in Japan. Billy came in from Japan just after that, and he had, a like, a hole in the side. He had a big yeah, wound Peter in the side of his neck, and... Peter had tried yeah. to bite his juggler or some damn thing. And, yeah, but, right, and then he picked him yeah, up and threw but, him through a plate glass window. Yeah, he, he was yeah. Uh, not that yeah. not that uh, well-liked by the boys, Billy. You know, he, right. a hell of a worker, but uh, a lot of guys, yeah. uh, nobody was shedding too many tears after that oh, ep- no. episode. What year and, was that? Was that in 72? I, I want to say 72 because I had just got back from Munich, Germany, and and uh, Billy Robinson and his wife Ula had a yeah. had a she was house German party. Too. When I got back, uh, Billy and Ula uh, called me and said they're having a big housewarming party. They just bought a big house over there in Minneapolis, and uh, so I went out, you know. And Billy has this big bite mark. I said, "Who in the hell bit you?" And he said, oh, it's a long story. He would never tell me because we were just starting training camp. Yeah. And he would never. Well, I wound up being real good friends with Peter Maiva. Yeah, he and, was a nice guy, big Peter. I, I spent oh, a lot of time with nice, him in Hawaii. Super nice guy, yeah. And we wound up, we did a little couple little angles in the WWF uh, several years after that. You know, nothing big or serious, you know, but. Peter went to uh, Vince McMahon and says, uh, Mr. McMahon, I want to work a program with Ken Patera. I like working with him. And he says, no, you have to work with Angelo Mosca. Well, <laughs> that just broke Peter's heart. Peter says, I can't work with him. He's a crowbar. He hurts me every time he hits me. And I want to work yeah. with Ken Patera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm the world's strongest man, and he, he wanted to work with me versus a crowbar football player. <laughs> I think there was, I think there was quite a few crowbars that came out of Calgary. I know Moscow started up here back in yeah, in well, they all came from your da- they all came from your dad's training camp. Yeah, every crowbar in the business back in those days, your dad trained. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah I, I used to hear that, you know. Oh, <laughs> they were yeah. all solid workers when they came out. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, he, yeah. Unleashed, he unleashed uh, the uh, curse on the... On the wrestling business. <laughs> uh, Ken, let's talk about you for a while. Uh, first of all, you come from a fairly sports family. I noticed your your brothers were involved in, in pro football and so on. And yeah. Tell us a little about that for some of the fans who uh, uh, don't recall uh, you know, what happened to you before then. Yeah, well, back in the 50s, my uh, oldest brother, Jack, he was three-time All-American at the University of Oregon. He got drafted by the Baltimore Colts, number one in the draft. But how much do you think he got paid for being drafted number one in the NFL draft in 1955? It was around 7,500, wasn't it? Oh, come on. <laughs> how did you 2, know that? 2,500, maybe. He got 5,500, yeah. and he got a $1,500 signing bonus. 
And that's what uh, yeah. Moscow got too. That was the standard going rate at that yeah. time. And, yeah. Uh, well, this and was uh, 1955, Moscow come. Uh, Angelo was what 59. Somewhere around then, uh, he I think he started with the Eagles and uh, then came up and uh, said he uh, got a higher contract offer to play in the Canadian Football League than he did in the NFL. And, and the same thing happened yeah. to a couple of others. Bud Grant was another one, came yeah, and played in Canada yeah. because he got more. Yeah, well, Bud was back in the late 40s. Yeah, uh, he was well, about ten years before Angelo, wasn't he? Yeah, or was he? In the yeah, field? he was uh, in. He was in Winnipeg, uh, uh, where I grew up, and uh, he uh, uh, was a player first, and later became the coach before right. he went to the Vikings. So. I think I think well, that was could... one reason, uh, Merv and uh, Ken, that so many of those football players went into wrestling because uh, they made more money wrestling yeah. off season than they were yeah. I, I know my dad had even with Billy Graham and Mosca and he had uh he had a bunch yeah. of others at Wilbur Snyder and guys like that yeah. they they were yeah. all uh Kaniski was another one they all uh, yeah. they were actually but making Gene more Kaniski, money that's, that's Canada's greatest athlete yeah I remember Gene <laughs> they all, I remember him when I was in grade school <laughs> they they all uh they played for the '52 Edmonton Eskimos, Kaniski, right. Wilbur Snyder, and Joe Blanchard, and they they yeah. started wrestling uh, right around that time. My dad was uh, yeah. he had a whole bunch of those football players that were, uh, and he said yeah. most of them weren't making more than like ten thousand a year playing football, you know. And uh, well, maybe sometimes not even that. Yeah, well, Stu used to hang around the training camps at the Calgary Stampeders and uh, looking at the uh, well-built players who were getting cut and then lined them up for wrestling school, and uh, yeah, that's where he got. I remember the coaches called my dad in a bit about 69 when they had that. They had a guy that, uh, Wayne Coleman, who became Billy yep. Graham's superstar. Yeah, yeah, superstar, the superstar. And they yeah, told me yeah. he was uh, involved in some illicit activities and all this all other kind, and uh, all kinds and, of illicit activities. <laughs> and uh, my dad kind of took a liking to him. He had a, he had a pretty yeah. good uh, streak of well, bullshit to him, you know. <laughs> and, uh, well, well, he had a great personality. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I mean, yeah, he, he could sell uh, frozen fish to an Eskimo. You know what and, I mean? My dad had this old alcoholic who was on the uh, downhill slide of his career named Dr. Jerry Graham up here at that time. And, oh, uh, yeah. Yes, I, I, and, you know, uh, I never met him. I never met him. <laughs> the, the, you know the guy that runs at WWF right now, Vince McMahon? That was his superhero. He just loved Dr. Jerry Graham. He just used to follow him around like a, like a little puppy dog back in the 60s. I think the last time I ever saw Dr. Jerry, my dad was still alive back then, maybe back in the 80s, and he said it was about 4 in the morning, and uh, somebody uh, pounding on his bedroom door <laughs> upstairs, yeah. and it was Dr. Jerry Graham. My dad hadn't seen him for I don't know how many years, and yeah. he was uh, completely uh, shit-faced and had yeah, been out. inebriated. Come on, inebriated. <laughs> and he... Uh, <laughs> He told told my dad that uh, he wanted my dad to uh, come with him and uh, kidnap his wife or something that she had left him or something. And oh four in the morning, and Doctor Jerry saying, "Stu, it's the good doctor." And uh, <laughs> that, that was, uh, I think, the last time I saw Doctor Jerry. But uh, no, the, the, these are fantastic stories when we look back. And Ken has been through that era when they were around, you know, sometimes at the end of their uh, uh, careers and uh, sometimes on their way up in their careers. So. Yeah, I remember That's some it. of those legendary characters being another guy who was around at that time, Merv, I don't know whether Ken crossed paths with him, but he was sort of in that same genre, was the killer buddy Austin. Yeah, I remember I him when he, he came to Calgary at the end of his career. He may have crossed paths. Uh, let's see, this was in the in the mid nineteen sixties when I was no, in I Calgary and Saskatoon and that's when when he, he was, was finishing up, and, up his career. 
you know, Bruce, I don't know if you know it, but I used to talk to your dad three, four times a year uh, back in the 80s. Did he ever uh, tell you? Yeah, I remember my dad was yeah. more like, so I was booking for my dad around the early 80s, but yeah. I remember a few times my dad told me he was hoping to get you up here because he always liked the big guys and uh Right. Yeah, it, it never quite yeah. happened, but I remember my dad had like guys like Kazmaier and Ted yeah, Orsini. Well, and I'm the one that turned him on to Kazmaier and, and Orsini. <laughs> yeah, and that. Uh, well, well, he <laughs> called me and asked me about those guys. I says, "Well, I I, I know Bill and I know uh, uh, Orsini. I met Orsini at uh, the Boston Garden one night through a mutual friend, and then I I was wrestling down for." Jim Barnett yep. and Georgia Championship Wrestling at the time, and Bill wanted to break in, but he wanted to go to the World's Strongest Men Contest first, and so on and so forth. So anyway, I got them both lined up to go through Tony Altamore's training camp. <laughs> what a fucking rib that was. <laughs> But anyway, then your dad called me, and I called him back. I I bet I talked to your dad three, four times a year for four or five years. I remember my yeah, dad a few times yeah. uh, would yeah. tell me, you know, he was hoping to get you. He sort of coveted as far back as the uh, 50s. He had guys like Doug Hepburn up here who was yeah, a weight, sure. and then uh, Paul Anderson. And, uh, yeah, he, I, I met he, both of those guys, yeah. He had a guy named Chuck Bruce. I can't remember what he was sort of a power lifter type, and then he had, uh-huh. he had a few of the bodybuilder types too, and uh, Sailor Art Thomas and Earl Maynard and oh, yeah. some of those guys too. You know, and, uh, yeah, yeah, I know both of those guys. Uh, the two black guys, really good guys. Yeah, I, my uh, dad was Sailor, always sort Sailor of Sailor Art Thomas was a character. <laughs> yeah, I remember we had this other guy. He was he wasn't that great a work or that good of a guy named Zulu. <laughs> he, yeah, he was I always Zulu. Magnificent yeah, Zulu. Wasn't, guy. He a shop, wasn't he a shop putter from UCLA? He may have been. You know, he's always up what, what, to what? some kind of misconduct and shit, you know. Her name is Ron <laughs> what, Pope. What, 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 what year are we talking about, about Zulu? Um, this would have been maybe in the mid-70s. I can't remember for some reason. Uh, uh, I think it was the guy in. Uh, I'm trying to remember what the hell his well, name I'm was. I'm thinking about somebody else. Then. Yeah. No, I don't recall. Zulu was but a big black again, guy. I was, and he yeah, broke I was in Calgary at that time. He was involved in that horseshit incident with the guy named Cowboy Frankie Lane, where they, uh, I think, uh, uh-huh. they were stalking each other. <laughs> Behind the building, and uh, well, I don't think either one of them was too tough or too uh, had too much yeah. balls either. But uh, I think uh, Zulu hit Frankie Lane on the head with a baseball bat or a crowbar or some yeah. damn thing, and yeah, some fucked up thing that was kind of part that, of the. That, uh, that, that <laughs> remembers the... uh, reminds me of an uh, old story that Bad News Brown. Uh, I, I worked with Bad News Brown just as I was finishing up in '88 in the WWF. Yeah, he, he wasn't a bad guy. He worked up here for. A, he, yeah, he, oh, he loved Calgary. He loved you. Ellen Coach, yeah, Bad yeah. News Ellen or whatever. Yeah, yeah, uh, but but anyway, one of my last TV shows for the WWF, we were down in Alabama, and I went. Uh, you know, they had those little makeshift offices for when we're on the road for TV shows. So I walked yeah. by the office. I looked to my left, and there's Vince McMahon in uh, one of the smaller uh, rooms. So I, I took two steps back, took a left, walked in there. I said, Vince, how are you doing today? He said, well, fine. I said, that bullshit you pulled on me out there in uh, California last night, I didn't appreciate. Well, what bullshit? I said, you know what I'm talking about. So anyway, he says, well, hey, well yeah, that was just a mistake. I said, no, it was no mistake. You know, I'm sick and tired of your bullshit. I got my bag here. I can either put it down and stay for two months, or I can just turn around walk out of here and fly home. What, 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 what's it going to be? Well, what, what are you talking about? What are you so excited about? I said, you've been paying me like a goddamn uh, uh preliminary match guy. I said, I'm still an asset. I'm not, you've been, treat me like a liability. 
I said, you want to treat me like a liability? I said, fuck you. I'll, I'll fly home. Well, God. So I told him, I said, you pay me what I'm worth for the next uh, two to four months and I'll stay. And then he started, well, you know, boss man's coming in, bad news, Brown needs somebody to get over with, and I don't know, a couple other guys. I said, okay, instead of paying me 2500 a week, why don't you pay me 5000 a week, and I'll put all those guys over. And uh, Survivor Series, which was the first Survivor Series, I said, that'll be my last show, and you'll never have to put up with me again. And that was it. And that, that that that's when I retired. I said, "Fuck, I'm gonna put up with this crap anymore." Yeah, what what he was paying me, I, I could have been working on a construction site with no uh, daily expenses and stuff, and been taking home just as much money. It's funny. I, I heard mean, similar to uh, from a lot of guys, and some of the guys who were making pretty good money. Uh, even my brother-in-law, Davy Boy, and them told yeah. me similar when they first went down there and they told me they weren't getting half as much as some of Vince's chosen you know oh, the guys yeah. that Vince liked or whatever yeah. they uh I know Dynamite yeah. told me he went in there and uh he was pretty big star at that time and, and basically said you know I'm getting nowhere near what uh some yeah. of your cronies or these New York well, guys well, are getting well let me tell you in, in the late 80s I went from thirty four, thirty six thousand a month down to uh, oh, ten thousand a month. You know, a lot of people listening say, "God, ten thousand a month—that's a lot of money." Well, when you're on the road every day and it costs you two to three hundred dollars a day to be on the road, when you get rid of your expenses, when you exna your expenses out of, you're not taking home anything. And uh, that, that, that's what, and Vince knew that, you know. So fuck him. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me, your, how, your days in some of the uh, smaller uh, territories uh, in the South, a lot of that was car travel, wasn't it? It was uh, a, a lot tougher in those days. Oh yeah, that was good. I worked that Texas territory. Uh, a good payday was thirty-five, forty-five dollars sometimes. Yeah, yeah, I remember used really to hear definitely. that Louisiana was the worst, like the Oklahoma, Louisiana, the trips and uh, well, the Cal- well, yeah, it, it, it was uh, 1,500, 1,800 miles a week. But I was working for Cowboy Bill Watts when Leroy McGurk was kind of relinquishing the territory to Bill. Yeah. And that was, uh, what year was that, 76. I used to hear the guys say about the trips were brutal, some of the... Uh, the trips were, oh, yeah. Five hundred miles a day. <laughs> well, when you look at the uh, Stampede territory, was, was uh, like that too, leaving Calgary, going to Edmonton on Tuesday, all the way to Saskatoon on Wednesday, yeah. Regina on Thursday, and Calgary on Friday. And Regina yeah. to Calgary is five hundred miles, yeah. and yeah, that was all by car. And you're talking about uh, forty below weather at times with uh, yeah. with blizzards. Uh, and uh, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it actually got worse, Merv, in the a- '80s because my dad started running Vancouver too, and uh, it was yeah. all driving, no flying. And uh, you, you're it's telling about me your dad mile. didn't buy an airplane to fly the guys out to Vancouver? My dad actually did buy an airplane, <laughs> but it got it actually got stolen by it's, it's this guy named Sam Maneker, which <laughs> oh my god. No, that was uh, a famous story. I didn't know story. that. I yeah. didn't know that, that part Some of kind of an inside job with Bearcat Wright and uh, Sam Maneker. And my dad, my dad, I don't know, it cost yeah, about a hundred thousand. Do that. Uh, Bearcat Wright was an outstanding uh, African American citizen. Yeah, he was. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he was sort of like a forerunner of. Uh, some of those famous African American uh, football well, players that are behind right, bars now, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not on the same level as O.J. Simpson. Yeah, just one but, step above. I don't think he committed yeah, homicide, but uh, you know. yeah, just a uh, just a step or two below O.J. Simpson. Yeah. Yeah. 
Oh, God, I knew so many of those black guys. guys. I, I mean, they're nice guys and everything, but you don't realize that uh, the background they come from and, and the mentality that they have. God, the only gonna... one that, that I really knew was Bad News Brown. And he grew up in New Jersey. He grew up in a rough neighborhood. He seemed like but a pretty he... principled guy, old Alan, you know. he. Uh, yeah. He, he, he was... Uh, pretty respect respectable guy yeah. as far as I recall, but uh yeah. he didn't have a lot of use for a lot of the other guys that he he'd tell me this guy's full of shit, this guy's yeah, a con yeah. man or you know, there yeah. there was enough of them that uh you know, fit yeah. the uh description. But I, I was wondering, yeah. uh I noticed Vernon never ever had any black guys was you know, there was a lot of Speculation about uh, you know what that Im- implied you know but uh, the last yeah. one I can recall offhand was Sweet Daddy Seeky, and that was in the fifties. Yeah, well, he brought in Sailor Art Thomas. Yeah, I remember Sailor Art. He came up and worked for Stu, and he, yeah. he always said that uh, yeah. he wasn't the greatest worker anyway, Art, but he nice guy. Oh, no. But uh, no, not he nice said that uh, yeah. he was always suggesting that. Vern didn't like blacks and all like that. I I never ever heard any official confirmation of that. But uh, uh, you get yeah, Manitoba like. and you get uh, Minnesota. Uh, there isn't much of a black population there to start no. with. So uh, when you want to draw, uh, the black that, population they, in Minnesota and Wisconsin back in those days was like one percent. Yeah. Was he? Yeah. he yeah. But, but uh, later uh, on, I'll, he was running like Chicago and Denver and Milwaukee and. Uh, well, so Milwaukee uh, would be, still be the same, and Denver very much the same too, uh, right. and and that's the demographic of his territory at the time, and I think that had a lot yeah. more to do with it than anything else. Yeah, because yeah. I, 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 let me tell you guys a quick story about Vern Gagne. When I when I uh, first met Vern in 1972, I think it was in or no, I'd met Vern. Uh, year or two before that book, but just before I started wrestling for Vern, it was uh, November of 72, and I went over to his office at the old Dykeman Hotel, uh, downtown Minneapolis, and he says, "Uh, Ken, I want you to go down and knock on room, I don't know, 524. So I went down and knocked on room 524, and a black girl opens the door. I says, how are you? He says, good. I said, Vern sent me down here. Oh, really? He says he wants me to bring you up to the office. And she says, yeah, okay. So I I take her up to the office. Her name was Alice. Alice was Vern's concubine for the next 20 years. I ran into her now that you mention it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Alice in Wonderland, eh? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, right, Alice in Wonderland. She, I mean, she was a gorgeous young girl. Yep. yep. For 20 years, she never got married. Vern paid for her uh, apartment and everything. She dressed like she just came out of a goddamn fashion magazine. And he sent her through college, too, didn't he? I yes. think you recall that. He, he gave her yeah. the tuition to go to college. and yeah. yeah, he treated her just like one of his kids. Last time I saw Alice was in ninety, or no, in uh, eighty nine. She was at a t one of the last TV tapings that Vern ever had, and uh, uh, Vern's wife Mary was sitting right across from her, and Mary didn't have a clue. <laughs> Never knew. <laughs> <laughs> you must have some pretty good Wally Carbo stories too. Wally was, uh, he was a amateur uh, thief. <laughs> That's the best way I can put it. Maybe a professional. Uh, yeah, he was, uh, he dealt with the real professional, Eddie Sharkey. Yeah. Wally, that, that, he was there long before Vern, wasn't he? Like in the, uh, yeah. it was Tony oh, Stecker. Yeah. And I know my yeah. dad told me he worked Minneapolis like in 48 or something like that, 47 <laughs> yeah. in there. He said oh, Wally yeah. was Wally was in the office then with uh, Tony Stucker and yeah, yeah. Uh, Wally, Wally grew up over in North Minneapolis, where which is where Eddie Sharkey grew up, 
Uh, what, what was the deal with Sharkey, too? I, I I know he worked for my dad in the early 60s, and he used to send some of the guys up here, like hawk and animal types. He was, I think even yeah. he contacted my dad about Backland, and he never he never could stand Burn, though, Eddie. You know, I, I never knew what uh, they... Well, there when Eddie some... went down to Kansas City to work for Bob Geigel, when he came back, Vern wouldn't use him. And Eddie Eddie says, I'm a better worker than anybody you got. And Vern says, yeah, I he, was a, a he was a pretty good little worker, my dad said. You know, he wasn't that well, big that, of a guy, that, but my dad said he was a pretty decent uh, hand. Well, that's as what, to... Yeah, but Vern says, you're too small. You're not big enough to work in my territory. I want big guys. Well, Eddie went in the office the day after that and shot the office up with a rifle. I heard some story, and then um, it was it was funny how many of the guys Eddie started ended up making money for Vern, like uh, Hawk and Animal. And, uh, yeah, but they were all big guys. Yeah, I think Backland had something to do with Eddie. And, uh, um, a little bit, but he actually broke in with Terry Funk down in uh, Amarillo, Texas. Yeah. I, I know a yeah. lot of those. Uh, they used to call. I, there was some name for them, the Minneapolis Mafia or, or some damn thing. But yeah, <laughs> all, all the guys that Eddie was breaking in, they were they're all pretty big, muscular guys. Rick Rude and I think, yeah, right. Uh, yeah, most of them couldn't stand Burn either, from what I heard. You know, they seemed to be. Yeah, yeah they all they were all anti Burn. I know we had a big yeah. black guy, Eddie Sark, he sent up named Larry Cameron, and pretty nice yeah, guy. Larry, and he, yeah, yeah. He couldn't stand Vern either. I don't know what the, but it seemed yeah. like they all had uh, an avowed yeah. disdain for Vern or whatever. I, didn't, I never knew yeah, what Cam, the. Uh, Cam, Cameron died over in Germany. Pretty nice guy. He was another of those football players that yeah, right. got into wrestling. And he, he was a nice guy, Larry. He had. Uh, yeah. He seemed like he was in perfect health, but I guess he had some congenital heart yeah, defect heart. or something. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, he I think he would have probably a heart attack over in Germany. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't think he was even that old. You know, uh, no. Well, he when he started, he was uh, the Portland Territory and wrestled in Vancouver quite a bit. Uh, yeah, there you yeah. go. I know yeah. he played for the BC Lions. That was his. Uh, yeah. he, he was yeah. the rookie of the year in the CFL for a bit uh, back when he yeah. started, and then. But, hey guys, I'm, I'm I, I hate to cut this short, but let's do it again. I, I'm yeah. I'm just getting swamped here. Well, um, it's certainly well, nice to talk to you again, Ken, because uh, I left Winnipeg in, in 1980, so I was yeah. there from 71 to 80. So that was right when you were starting up, and yeah, uh, yeah. And, I remember, uh, yeah. good memories. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not completely brain dead. <laughs> well, I really might uh, enjoyed. Think I am, but I, I, I have a pretty good memory. It gets it's me in trouble a, sometimes. It's been great talking to you, Ken. I, I uh, I've heard so many nice things about you, and you certainly lived up to everything. And uh, I know my dad and uh, my brothers uh, and well, a lot of the Minneapolis wrestlers. Yeah, they I all love used your to. Have, yeah, they all had. Uh, <laughs> Nice things to say about you. Uh, yeah. Certainly, uh, yeah. I, I feel. Well, I, have uh, some, I have some stories about that Bret Hart. Yeah, you you know that guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> ran into him. But, but, yeah. <laughs> but I know my brother-in-law was sort of. My brother-in-law idolized you. He he was always telling me when he was oh, breaking yeah. in, Nightheart. Yeah, yeah. He used to watch uh, shot putting films of me when he was in college. <laughs> Yeah, and, I remember uh, him telling yeah. me was, he started up here in the late seventies, but he, he was always telling yeah. me he wanted to be like Ken Patera. You know, he was always telling yeah. me you were an Olympic uh, shot putter and all like that. And he, yeah. he had done that at UCLA or something. Yeah, at UCLA. Yeah. Okay. All the best, Ken, and uh, God bless. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.